If you're a pop culture junkie who loves TV, film, music, comedy, and other really important stuff, then you've come to the right place. Get ready and settle in for Classic Conversations, the best pop culture interviews in the world. That's right, we circled the globe so you don't have to. If you're ready to be the king of the water cooler, then you're ready for Classic Conversations with your host, Jeff Dwoskin. All right, Stephanie, thank you so much for that amazing introduction. You get the show going each and every week, and this week was no exception. Welcome, everybody, to episode 270 of Classic Conversations. As always, I am your host, Jeff Dwoskin. Great to have you back for what's sure to be the most muppet riffic show of all time. That's right. I said muppet riffic because my guest today is none other than Craig Shemin, president of the Jim Henson Legacy, Muppet historian, and author of Sam and Friends, the story of Jim Henson's first television show. Get ready to light the lights because it's time to meet Sam and Friends on the Classic Conversation show tonight. All right, but that's coming up in just a few seconds. In the meantime, I do want to remind everyone, Park Overall joined us last week. Amazing conversation with Park. You love drawing Empty Nest. Amazing activist now. Talks all about her career. Do not miss that. But right now, it's time to play the music. It's time to dress up right. It's time to share my conversation with Craig Shemin on the that's a conversation show tonight. Anyway, it's something like that. I worked better in my head. Anyway, enjoy. All right, everyone. I'm excited to introduce my next guest, president of the Jim Henson Legacy, Muppet historian, author of Sam and Friends, the story of Jim Henson's first television show. There's tons of other credits as well, but I just want to get right to it. Welcome to the show, Craig Shemin. Thank you, Jeff. It's great to be here. So great to have you. I'm a, a Muppet fan. I love the Muppets. I don't know who doesn't, right? I mean, we had to question anyone who wouldn't. So when I saw your book, Sam and Friends, the story of Jim Henson's first show, I had no idea. It was my first exposure to that. It was really cool diving in and getting some backstory that, frankly, I had no idea about. Point of the book, too, right? <laughs> You know, absolutely. I think a lot of people, the first thing they know about Jim Henson was from Sesame Street, because that was the first big thing that he was involved in on a national level. And a lot of people just don't know he had already been doing it for like 15 years before that. It was one of these overnight sensations that took 15 years to, to happen. It was interesting. I There was like a 30 minute clip of the very limited what's remained of the Sam and Friends. When I was watching it, the one thing that kind of just struck me was how good it was, like how formed it was. It wasn't like a, a shell of what you could see Jim Henson becoming. It was really great. Yeah, it really does surprise people because a lot of these things were things that you could have seen on The Muppet Show if the, you know, if the, the image quality was a bit better and the characters. So in fact, he did a few of these things that he had done on Sam and Friends. They repeated them on The Muppet Show. So I think, yeah, it was something like really fun and, and raw about those early shows, but Jane Henson used to say it was some of the best things they had ever done, even though Jim, you know, there was a time when he really didn't appreciate his own work on Sam and Friends. He was like, oh, it wasn't a good show. But then, you know, I think he came around and realized that it really was a good show, but the technology really sort of got in the way that Jim was trying to push this technology as much as it could. And there are limitations in cameras and lenses and, you know, the fact that couldn't really save the show except by filming it with a 60 millimeter camera. But the show itself, the core of it, in fact, right now I'm working on a follow-up book, which is compiling Jim Henson's scripts for Sam and Friends. So I've pulled out about 60 of the scripts to show that it's really fun and clever material. And I think people get a kick out of seeing more material because there's not a lot out there, like you said. It was fascinating, too, that they were just five minute segments of a morning show in Washington, D.C. We had something called Hot Fudge here that I grew up loving. Mm -hmm. But OK, but let's put a pin in Sam and Friends in a second. I want to talk about your origin story and how you made it to the Jim Henson Company. You have a speech and radio TV film degree. You were at Northwestern University. That's right. They call it communications now. 
<laughs> when I was there, it was a degree in speech because it was like the major started back, you know, in the days of the 1920s or whatever, when you, you would get a degree in speech, but then they changed it to communications. So at that point, before interning for the Henson Company, what was your plan? Like, what had you hoped to do? You know, I was really interested in writing and I kind of felt that my life would take me to some sort of writing career. And once I convinced my parents that that was like a, a valid thing, as many parents do, it's like, we want you to get something to fall back on. And for a while, I, I took an accounting class in college and I just was awful and it. couldn't get anything to match up. So I said, okay, I'm, I'm dropping this before I will get a, a failing mark. So I got out of accounting. And I decided, oh, no, I'm, I'm not going to get anything to fall back on because, you know, the more you think of it, there are a lot of things a writer can do. You know, you can write for publications. You can. I ended up doing a lot of them once I actually got to Muppets because I wrote everything I wrote for television. I wrote episodes of shows, but I also wrote trading cards, computer games. I wrote the tags that are going on merchandise from licensed product, every type of thing, industrial films. So. I kind of figured that that would be my future, whether I, you know, would luck be lucky enough to work in television or film or to just be involved in some way writing. So it just was, it, it just happened, I ended up getting an internship and followed that path at the Henson Company. I have the same accounting background as you. I failed out and the pressure was because my grandpa was an accountant and it was like, and I sat next to the the girl, you know, the one in class that goes, oh, I failed and then gets a 95% or an A. <laughs> yeah. right? That's why I sat next to you, which made it even worse. I feel you. All right. So you want to be a writer, but you started out as an intern yep. with Jim Henson. In 1987, um, he was still around. I was a big fan from when I was a, a younger kid. The Muppet Show came out when I was about 10 years old. So it was like right there. And I grew up with Sesame Street. I was in that first Sesame Street, you know, sort of graduating class because I was born in 66 and Sesame Street came on in 69. So I was, you know, right there. I was watching that, watched The Muppet Show, loved it. And, I, you know, this was before you had the internet. So I'd go to the library to look up articles about Jim Henson. And I was a big fan. I just sort of like I got older and then sort of that left my mind. But I was a really big fan for a long time when I was 10, 11, 12. In college, I was trying to figure out what to do for my the summer between junior and senior year, and a lot of us were trying to get internships. And I happened to see a documentary in my dorm. Uh, it was on the public TV station in Chicago. I went to Northwestern. And it was a show called Henson's Place, and it was a one-hour documentary about Jim Henson. And they had footage from Labyrinth, was coming out just about the time they made this documentary. The show was about one or two years old when I saw it. I started thinking, hey, that would be a really cool place to internship. They're in New York. I'm from New Jersey, so maybe I could live at home and take the bus in. So the next day, I called information, tell you how long ago this was, and I got the number for Henson Associates, which is what it was called then in New York. And I called them and I asked if they had internships and they connected me to someone who made an appointment to interview me. We were maybe two or three weeks away from a spring break, so I knew I'd be going home. And then I went and did a, an interview during that break and they offered me an internship, but it was in the public relations department, which didn't sound that fun, but I figured, hey, I'll get in there. And it was during that internship that I met Jim for the first time at the company softball game. What uh, position did Jim Henson play on the team? <laughs> Whatever he wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> he was pretty much an outfielder, you know, but he came up to me. He, he knew everybody in the company. It was a pretty small company, but he didn't recognize me. And he came up and started a conversation. Uh, you know, I told him I was an intern. He's like, oh, I heard we had an intern. And he welcomed me. And then he didn't have a, a glove. And I had my old little league uh, baseball glove with me. So I loaned that to him. And we, we were on opposing teams, so we would keep on swapping it back forth. And at the end of the day, I had him autograph my glove. And do you still have it? Yeah, I, of course. Yeah, I had Frank Oz sign it too. So I think I probably have the only game-used Jim Henson autographed baseball glove. And where does that sit in your house? We have a little, my wife and I have a little display case in our living room with various collectibles and things that we've accumulated over the years. So that sits right in a place of honor. That's really cool. I love that. That's awesome. Then you went on to archives. The following year, they offered me a full-time position in the public relations department, which at that time had supervision over the archives. We didn't have like an actual full-time archivist. The whole idea, we were just trying to save stuff so it wouldn't get thrown away because... Uh, 
Jim always wanted to save things. He didn't necessarily like looking at them and looking back, but figured it was important to save things. So part of my job in public relations was to look after the archives, but because my primary job in public relations was to answer the telephone and departmental stuff going and making sure that my supervisor was kept apprised of everything, I didn't have a lot of time to devote to the archives. What was the craziest thing you ever found in the archives that maybe even didn't go anywhere? You would see various, like it was not unusual to open a box and you see like a head from the dark crystal. Or one of the things we found, it's like, oh, here are these long arms and hands from Labyrinth. There was a scene with the shaft of hands and it's like, oh, of course there are hands in here. Uh, <laughs> you, you would just, uh, there was nothing unusual when you think about the fact that this was the Henson company. So nothing could surprise you because you knew how many weird and ridiculous things they had ma made over the years. Is the room I'm picturing it, does it look like the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark? Is this... The storage, we had offsite storage. And this was, I, I tell this story in my book, but that's when I found a lot of the really important historical images and scripts and things. Jim had put them away. It was in a box mark, old production files. And they were put into deep storage in this huge warehouse up near the George Washington Bridge, which does look just like that scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark. And it was always a big sign. It said, Sophia Brothers Fireproof Warehouse. And you go in there and everything's cardboard and wood. And it's like, how can this be fireproof? It's like, okay, yeah, the building is fireproof, but everything in it <laughs> is kindling, basically. Right, right. They, they make no claims on the content. Yeah. The, the building won't burn down. Yeah, everything but... in there could burn to a crisp, but the building's going to be fine. Yeah, so we were changing storage locations, and I was sent there from my department. It's like, oh, make sure that everything in the PR storage is supposed to be there. So it was like all these press kit folders and stuff. And then on my way there, someone from the production department said, hey, here's a list of old production files we have listed as old production files. We don't need them anymore. Maybe you want them for archives. So I pulled out those files, and those had like all of the old Sam and Friends scripts and Jim's storyboards for Sesame Street counting films and the original drawings of Rolf and these other characters. And Jim had just carefully saved them and put them aside, but made no real effort to track where everything was. We just, we just, it was just under old production files. So I brought them back and that a lot of that stuff I was able to use late, decades later in the book and also in a lot of these touring and permanent exhibits. We have a great archivist at Tenson, now Karen Falk, and she sort of, after I uh, was promoted to being a staff writer, she had been hired and she really went through everything that I sort of just blindly saved and gathered. And she did a great job cataloging it and preserving it and conserving it. Amazing. I can't even imagine craziness of everything that you must have stumbled upon. When you went to work for Henson as the intern, were you aware of Sam and Friends or you kind of discovered it? Um, I was a little bit aware because I, you know, I'd looked up things over the years and, and tried to read whatever I could. I didn't really understand what it was until I started seeing these old kinescopes. And during my internship, I started watching some of these tapes. We had a big conference room at the old Henson townhouse on 69th Street. In that conference room was a wall of old three quarter inch videotapes. So you could go in during lunchtime if no one was using the conference room and just grab a tape off and, and put it in the machine and watch on the, the television in the, in the conference room. So that's where I started exploring and seeing like the, the Sam and Friends episodes and a lot of these old commercials and really appreciating them. It's funny as I was kind of going through, <laughs> I'm, I'm just a few years younger than you. Don't rub it in. Well, I've just because <laughs> like there's some of the nostalgia terms that now belong in the Smithsonian themselves, like. You ran a prodigy group, prodigy, an online group, <laughs> and like the CD-ROMs that you did, you know. I remember, this will sound quaint, I remember when the World Wide Web was first becoming active and there were a bunch of Muppet fans that had started their little web pages for various Muppet topics. And since I was working on some of these early computer projects for Henson, I had put together a little show and tell for the people in the merchandising departments, consumer products and publishing. At Henson, I, we set up a computer, I got it, everybody gather around, and I showed them some of these Muppet fan pages. And they just were puzzled by it. The heads of these departments were like, who did this? 
I was like, well, just Muppet fans. Well, why? Why would they do this? Well, because they're fans. They're trying to share their fandom. And nobody's paying them to do this. And it's like, no, they're doing it because they love this stuff. They couldn't get behind the idea that someone would go to all this trouble and not be paid for it because that's what they do. You know, they were getting paid to try and get Muppet product out there. And I'm like, well, you can use this as a tool to reach people. And it took a long time until they really, you know, it took a long time until we had a Henson website and a Muppet website. But it was, uh, you know, it was the early days back. Uh, it was a frontier of uh, Internet. Way back when. The Muppets, though, have always adapted well, I think. They all have Twitter accounts or yeah, X yeah. or whatever. And uh, the personalities are out there and the YouTube videos that went, all went viral. One of my favorite things to do early on, there we had a Henson.com and a Muppets.com website. This was in the days when the Henson company still owned all of the different character groups. Yeah, I wrote an Ask Dr. Honeydew column <laughs> for the Muppets.com site. And it was so great because, you know, you could come up with all sorts of different. We had a question about, sort of an homage to the old song. Um, and it's like, uh, can a little ant really move a rubber tree plant? And I had Dr. Honeydew say, well, you know, here at Muppet Labs, we have the Department of Ant Enlargement and the Department of Rubber Tree Miniaturization, and we hope to be able to have them meet halfway, you know, that sort of thing. And that was sort of the cool thing about Dr. Honeydew. He, he would always try and find the most complicated solution to any problem mo and the most ridiculous solution. I know. And always upstage by Beaker. Of course, who yeah. would end up suffering horribly. <laughs> My only foray into free Muppet fandom was I was a Huff Post writer, a contributor. And mm -hmm. in 2015, I wrote, when Miss Piggy and Kermit broke up, I wrote an article one of the things I'm most proud of, actually, to this day. <laughs> How to explain the Miss Piggy Kermit breakup to your parents. <laughs> it was a guide for kids to get their parents through this rough time. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Sorry to interrupt. I have to take a quick break. Thank you for your support of the sponsors. When you support the sponsors, you're supporting us here at Classic Conversations. And that's how we keep the lights on. And now more Muppets with Craig Shemin. I mean, that was the great thing is, you know, when you're working for the characters, you know, Miss Piggy was always the most fun to write for. And Kermit was always, well, well you know, yeah, he's Kermit. So it's a challenge. But with Miss Piggy, you could go really out there. You wrote a cookbook with Miss Piggy. Yes. In the kitchen with Miss Piggy. Uh, yes, I co-wrote it with Miss Piggy and uh, another writer, Allison Inches. So I assume that's kind of like a, a just kosher recipes? <laughs> <laughs> Basically, no pork? Uh, what? <laughs> well, a couple of people, it was a celebrity cookbook. So Miss Piggy, we reached out to a whole bunch of different celebrities and had them contribute recipes. And one or two were insensitive and it include pork recipes, which Miss <laughs> Piggy did point out. That is criminal. <laughs> so when you moved into writing, What's your favorite thing you ever wrote for the Muppets? That's a really good question. I think that, I think my favorite thing, or so many, but I think one of the, the most special early things that, that I got to write, we did a Muppet CD-ROM game called Muppets Inside. That was special to me because I got to really write and supervise the writing of most of the, the thing. There was one game where it was a lot of questions and answers, and we brought in someone who sort of specialized in that sort of quiz show writing to write a lot of the questions. But I wrote the entire script with the uh, exception of that. And that was a lot of fun to do because the Muppet stuff was fun, but it was also, you know, it was new ground in terms of doing this interactive computer CD-ROM game. And we were writing it for a brand new operating system, Windows 95. What? <laughs> and people, you know, we were all sitting around. It's like, it, it's like, are you sure we should be doing this? It's only going to work on Windows 95. And at that time, Windows 95 had not yet shipped. So we were like, are people going to have Windows 95? And they're trying to, it's like, every computer is going to have it from now on. Yes, it will be fine. And it got great reviews. And the whole thing, it starts out with this new version of the Muppet Show theme. And then it freezes and crash. And we scripted this computer crash. And then the Muppets sort of opened the screen. And we were using all sorts of really cool technology. The game would take a snapshot of your computer screen. So when the Muppets opened it up, your whatever was on your desktop would be split open. So it, it looked like the Muppets were actually in there. That's amazing. 
I love, I love and, it. And we did these great parody games like the Chef's Kitchen, the Swedish Chef's Kitchen of Doom. And it was a Doom version, but with the Swedish Chef doing the first person shooting of <laughs> eggs and things. He'd throw eggs. Sure, at sure. It's awesome. Yeah, we did sort of a missile command game with Gonzo, I think. You know, it was all these like little mini game parodies that you'd have to play all these games to pick up members of the Muppets who had been scattered fall through the computer. And once you were able to pick up everybody, it would end the game and the, the Muppet Show theme would play and we'd do a whole little closing thing. And it was so much fun to do. Uh, and one of the reasons it was fun is that no one at Henson really understood what we were doing. So I didn't get a lot of notes because they didn't, they, they didn't know. It's like I, my boss at the time was a, a great guy, Mike, Michael Frith, who was a, a head designer. And I sent him the script for notes and he didn't quite understand the whole idea of this branching computer game. And he said, oh, you know, I see an ending on page seven and then it goes on for another 130 pages. I'm not quite sure I understand. And I'm like, well, yeah, well, don't worry. It's like, oh, I'm sure it's okay then, you know. <laughs> so, you know, no, no notes here. Yeah. Could corrected a few little things, but I had a lot of freedom to work on it. And it's something that's very special to me. And the saddest thing is that, you know, you can't really play it anymore. There are some people that have emulators. There are gameplay sort of walkthroughs on YouTube that people have, have recorded. So if you, you want to watch some of the stuff, you can watch some of the elements. But it's sort of sad that it's sort of a, a little thing lost to time. I know. It's it's interesting to think like what technology we, we rely on right now that isn't going to be around. Like I don't have CD player on my computer. Mm -hmm. I don't even have a CD. I can't even play DVDs anymore. And it's like I used to have zip drives, quest drives. It has just a wealth of stuff on it that oh yeah, yeah. just you can't even get to. Oh, man. So you also wrote guest appearances, right? Because that was a big thing on how the Muppets... That's one of the things I, I kind of learned from your book was guesting and appearing on other shows is what helped make the Muppets so huge. It really did in the 60s. And by the time I was there working on it in the 90s, it was sort of the way you kept the characters alive between television shows. And it was a great way to use, you'd use these guest appearances to promote things because officially the Muppets don't promote products, or at least at that point in time, we didn't promote products, but we could appear on a talk show to do a promotional event if we didn't mention the specific product and the host would hold up. And it's like, oh yeah, this DVD is available. But yeah, I did a lot of those. We did a lot of the morning shows, the Today Show and Good Morning America and CBS This Morning, you know, Rosie O'Donnell. We did a Kermit and Miss Piggy opening for Monday Night Football. Yeah, I, I mean, that's one of the you know things I, I worked on you know fairly early on. You do a lot of them with uh, Jim Lewis, who was another Henson staff writer. And we would come up with something and then we'd work with the performers doing Miss Piggy appearances on the Today Show. We'd always work with Frank Oz and he would sort of, the way he would work is to try and get to the essence of the comedy beats. You know, we would write something scripted and then he would sort of say, okay, I want to get to this and I want to hit this. And he'd sort of cross out a lot of the, the words and he would take the script and he would turn it into a little index card that he would tape to his, his knee. So he would get, you know, if, he, if there was a specific line and a joke that he wanted to hit, he would work that thing, but everything leading up to it would be, he would figure out some improvised dialogue to get there. He would do that, he would kill it, and then he'd come back to us and it's like, oh, I should have used more of your stuff. But he, you know, it, it was Frank Oz, so he knew what he was doing. That's impressive because that's a whole secondary skill. I mean, besides yeah. Muppetry, to be able to edit and know how to deliver punchlines and all that kind of stuff. Early, when I was, I think I was still an intern, I got to go over and watch Jim and Frank do Ernie and Bert at Sesame Street. Jim was still around. And it was great because that's what they would do in Sesame Street. They'd sort of read through the script and they'd figure out, oh, we can cut this line and we can get to this faster. And they sort of, you know, I'm sure the writers on Sesame Street worked very carefully and figured, hey, th this is it. This is what it's going to be like. And then Jim and Frank would get there and then they'd learn, oh yeah, well, we didn't need this and we didn't need this. And Frank and Jim would just sort of find that essence and pair away the unnecessary material. And they had a great instinct for doing that because they had, they come at it from different mindsets. Frank always says that Jim goes with the flow and Frank fights the flow. It's like, he's always sort of pushing back on things. So that's why Ernie's just all nice and playful and Bert's just. Bert's Bert. Yeah. Bert's Bert. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about your responsibilities as president of the Jim Henson Legacy nonprofit. 
Uh, yeah, there are not a lot of responsibilities per se. What we try and do is I work with this group of people. Some of them worked with Jim for many years, and some of them on our board are Jim's children. Cheryl Henson and Heather Henson are on, on the board, and Karen Falk, the Henson archivist, and Bonnie Erickson, who was the designer who did Miss Piggy. And it's all about trying to share Jim Henson's art with the world. And Jane Henson, Jim's wife, had founded this organization. And it was really, you know, people were like, well, is this necessary? She founded it shortly after Jim died. She was getting a lot of requests from people to name stuff after Jim or honor him, present awards. So she figured an organization would be a good thing to receive this stuff. Then it, it sort of grew because the Jim Henson legacy became custodians of this big puppetry collection, of a, a collection of puppets from the Henson work that were not in performable condition. You know, there was a short time when the Henson Company was sold to a German conglomerate. And one of the terms of that deal is that they got all of the puppets that were performable and anything that was not in performable condition, all these vintage puppets, remained property of the Henson family. So the Henson family asked the Jim Henson legacy to sort of take care of it. So over the years, we cataloged, took care of it, allowed elements to be displayed. We put together some some exhibits ourselves. And then we found homes for a good deal of the collection, uh, either in the Smithsonian, which has the Sam and Friends characters, or the Center for Puppetry Arts in Atlanta, which has a big collection now of Henson stuff in a permanent exhibit, and the Museum of the Moving Image in Queens, which also has a traveling exhibit. So they have the major uh, Henson collections of puppetry and of uh, puppets and prop and things, artifacts. Over the years, that sort of so our role of Jim Henson legacy has sort of evolved over the years. Originally, it was just to deal with the public in terms of honors, and then it became a preservation and dispensation of the Henson family's puppet collection. And then now it, what we do is we just work with these various partners to help them with their programming. So I work with the Museum of the Moving Image to program their screening series. We all work with the Center for Puppetry Arts and, and the other partners. We'll do events with the Smithsonian. So it's all about celebrating Jim Henson in a way. The fact is that the Henson characters are owned by primarily three different companies now. Disney owns the classic Muppet characters and Sesame Workshop owns the Sesame Street characters and everything else Bear in the Big Blue House is also owned by Disney. And then everything else is owned by the Henson family and the Henson Company. So that covers Fraggle Rock and Dark Crystal and Ebbet Otter and Labyrinth. So each of these companies has their responsibility to their own parts of Jim Henson's collection. But we try and make sure that all of these things are still connected to Jim by name. Because Sesame Street has limited use of Jim's name. I think they can call the characters Jim Henson Sesame Street Muppets. Disney doesn't have the usage of Jim's name in most circumstances, and the Henson Company can use Jim's name. So we feel, you know, when we do stuff with the Jim Henson legacy, it's our way of connecting Jim to all of these things that he did. Wow. That is quite a task for you, sir. That's awesome, though. That's great. So far, it seems extremely successful. I mean, the Muppets always seem alive, the whole Jim Henson legacy. Yeah. You mentioned this a little before, and then one of the coolest things about what we do is to sort of give people this new information that, hey, yeah, Jim did this too. Uh, you know, especially the exhibit we have at Museum of the Moving Image, people didn't know that Jim made experimental films in the 60s, that he was nominated for an Oscar for Best Short Film, that he did these really weird television things and, and a lot of experimental commercials because people think of him as doing the Muppets. So it's really exciting for us to share, you know, we love the Muppets and we love all of these other things that people know about, but it's really exciting to share things with people that they don't know. Say, hey, I you know you love Kermit and Spiky, but hey, have you seen this? That's great. And for the hardcore fans, I mean, even just people who are starting to fall in love with it, it's great stuff. It's great to see like these origins. So like, like in Sam and Friends, uh, one of the things I read in the book, which I thought was interesting was, so Kermit is in Sam and Friends. He's not a frog yep. yet. Yeah. But uh, the only character to not have survived, but that's still around today, active, is Kermit, and it, his current Kermit the Frog. 
But in Sam and Friends, when they did a vote of the most popular characters, he was fourth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then the other interesting thing was, moving forward just a little bit, right? They, I think this is after Sam and Friends, maybe, uh, the Purina dog chow commercial. Mm -hmm. And they invent Ralph, who's one of my favorite characters, who I didn't know was the most famous character ever at one point. Yeah, yeah. He was the Muppets big star. In fact, in September, I don't know when this drops, but on September 24th at the Museum of the Moving Image, it's Jim Henson's birthday, and we are going to be doing a compilation of Rolf's appearances on the Jimmy Dean Show. Yeah, he was a big star. Got lots of fan mail. And then what's great is that after that, he sort of went back to, if you saw some of the interviews with Rolf later on, he's like, yeah, I used to be a big star. Now I live in a box. You know, he was sort of resigned to the fact that he used to be big. Why didn't he stay big? I love Ralph. He was always one of my favorites, a little piano I think, playing. You know, he <laughs> just sort of segued to a different, you know, he what used to be the one guy out front because on the, on the Jimmy Dean show, you had Jimmy Dean, this country singer who went on to a big career in sausage making. So it was just Jimmy Dean and, you know, Ralph would appear in every uh, episode. So there weren't other Muppets. So it was just Jimmy Dean and Ralph. So he would, became big. And then later on, it was like, Rolf's still around, but now he's just one of this group. Now he's the dog who plays piano. So I think he just became one of the ensemble. But Kermit's always moved along, right? So Kermit was on yeah. Sesame Street. He was a reporter on Sesame yep. Street, right? And then gets his own show. <laughs> yep. The Muppet Show, where he's, again, front and center, and then probably becomes the Kermit that we all know. Absolutely, yeah. It probably didn't hurt that it was Jim Henson voicing him. <laughs> Yeah. And I think that it's a lesson to us all show business. I mean, it can be fickle. One day you're getting tons of fan mail with Jimmy Dean and the next week you're living in a box. You know, <laughs> uh, That's so funny. All right. So uh, the book, Sam and Friends, the story of Jim Henson's first television show. Bear Manor Media. I'll put links in the show notes. so Everyone will be able to, to go buy it. So Sam and Friends ran from 55, 1955 to 1961. Right. Like when you were digging into this, like what was the most surprising thing that you found? Like, was there something in a script? You're like, oh my God, how'd they get away with this? <laughs> well, I think that there were a bunch of surprising things, just that we knew until I really dug into it, you know, Sam and Friends from the surviving kinescopes, which are only about 15 of them. And then found the script. And then about seven or eight years ago, the Henson Archives found a box that had about 45 reel-to-reel -reel tapes that Jim had started recording the audio. So suddenly you have 40, you know, 45 tapes and between them, it's about 440 episodes of Sam and Friends. So you can see like what they did every day. The, I think the thing that really was surprising is that, yeah, they, they would make fun of what was happening. They were in the same studio where uh, Nixon and Kennedy did one of their presidential debates. The Sam and Friends broadcast was like only about an hour, hour and a half before the debate. So they, you know, they did their show. They were sort of sent to the secondary studio because the main studio that they were usually in was being occupied by the debate. So they did a, an episode where while they're talking about the debate, everybody's getting ready for the debate. The equipment is being brought out in front of them. It's like, oh, we need this in the other studio for the debate. And they're trying to come up with questions for the big presidential debate. Interesting. You think of when you first see some of those kinescopes, and it's like, yeah, Sam and Friends is this cute little Muppet thing, but you don't really think about it interacting with other stuff that was happening historically in the world. It's interesting because they could probably get away with things too. And they're like, oh, it's like, it's a puppet. <laughs> exactly. If, you know, they could get away with stuff that people could not. And I think it's still that way. You know, if Miss Piggy, you know, is insulting to someone, it's like, oh, isn't that cute? It's Miss Piggy. <laughs> you know, we just lost, there was a, an English talk show host, Michael Parkinson, just passed away. And the Muppets did a guest appearance on Parkinson's show in the 70s during the run of the Muppet show. And they did this running bit over Fozzie and Piggy we're both asking Michael Parkinson if he wears a toupee. And it was just, you know, <laughs> Fozzie's just staring at him and it's like, um, yeah, I have a question. Is that a toupee? And caught Michael Parkinson off guard, but he's laughing hysterically. But if people were asking him that, he would be offended. Right. Uh, yeah, that is so funny. Oh, uh, yeah. Because what can he do? He just laugh, right? Yeah. And, and later on, Piggy is staring at him and asks the same, you know, she's like looking at your eyes and I just have one question. Is that a toupee? And, you know, and he takes it in an entirely different direction. Parkinson's like, well, if things work out, you could find out, you know. 
I'll be upset if the answer is no, but when you're writing for the Muppets, do you do what you just did? Yes. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> It's it's important to do that because you have to make sure that this dialogue is going to fit the characters. So yes, I I will do very bad Muppet impersonations when I'm, when I'm writing. That could be a whole thing, bad Muppet impersonations. But it's they weren't that bad. Some knew, some no some worse were. than others. Yeah. Right. I wish I, if I could do uh, Waka Waka Waka. I mean, better. I would do it all the time. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite place in the world is at uh, Hollywood Studios, at the Muppet oh, yeah. Theater. Uh, that's a great thing. Yeah. I, I remember um, I did a little work on that when that was going into um, the Muppet Vision 3D. I didn't work on the movie, but I got to work on the installation and we did these posters and there were parody posters. We had to come up with parody posters of different Muppet fake movies. And we did like a Tarzan movie. It was all based on old photography that had been taken for Muppet calendars. Uh, one of the favorite things that I had written for that, it was a, a Tarzan movie. And I wrote the headline. It was Tarzan. Uh, Kermit was Tarzan and Miss Piggy was Jane. And the headline I wrote was, she's Hollywood, he's Vine. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. I think they stole that when they were doing the Barbie stuff. Yeah, there you go. All right. So Sam and Friends, mm -hmm. completely live, lip synced. How was that easier? I would. <laughs> <laughs> it just seemed like, uh, it just seemed like that would be even harder to do. It is hard. I think that at that point, they thought it would be easier to pre-record all the audio. I mean, in the very beginning, they did it that way because they were mostly lip syncing to, to records. And I think later on, they did it that way because Jim was providing most of the voices. So it was easier for him to pre-record it and edit together the audio of him doing all the voices and then lip sync to that. But it also was easier because they didn't have a live microphone on in the studio. So they could talk to each other while they were working. And Jim could say, get a little closer, or, you know, and the stagehands could laugh and enjoy themselves and, and wouldn't get out over the air. So, yeah, it's not necessarily easier at that. You know, it was sort of the way they did it and it just sort of evolved. And then by the time they got to the late 60s and Sesame Street, that evolved into pre-recording the music ahead of time and lip syncing to that. But the dialogue would always be done live on the studio floor. Gotcha. It wasn't uncommon for Jim just to create new characters for anything that he was doing. So even right. like when they would do the, you talk about um, doing a coffee commercial. And it was interesting because like, this is how like Jim became the voice or and knocked out Paul Arnold. Yep. Yeah. It's <laughs> just interesting how things come about, right? They had 10 seconds to do call letters, but that mm -hmm. only took three seconds. So they had to fill seven seconds. <laughs> It was funny. The first thing I thought of when it said seven second commercial was how later it expanded to 30 seconds a minute. And then mm -hmm. a few years ago, it got down to you got to tell the story in six seconds. Yeah. And, you know, they were still doing 30 second, 60 second commercials because they were doing longer commercials eventually on Salmon Friends, you know, when they, they had a sponsor. But this particular coffee commercial thing just grew out of a very specific need. It's like we got to do the station ID, like you said, and we have this time over. What can we do? Let's sell that time. That became very successful. And like you said, that was where Jim first got really comfortable doing his voice. And I think one of the reasons it was comfortable is that there was just very short things. So it was only one or two sentences. And that got Jim more comfortable. That's when Sam and Friends started getting more dialogue and Jim coming up with characters. The commercials were done and redone for different products around the country. And it was amazing. They did like 180 of these commercials and they were inexpensive, relatively speaking. I think a company would pay like $3,000 for a commercial, which back then was, you know, there were expenses to make them, but Jim and Jane still pocketed a good deal of money off of those. Not bad for like a part-time college job. Oh, that's amazing. Sorry to interrupt, but we have to take a quick break. And we're back. Who's got a dollar? I read in your book, it said that for a dollar, you could send in. The coffee was uh, Wilkinson's. Wilkins. Wilkins yeah. Coffee. And you could send in a dollar and proof of purchase and get these Wilkins puppets. And that they yeah. sold 25,000. So I went on eBay. I couldn't specifically find anything on eBay. Uh, there was like pictures of the patent you could buy. But they yeah. did have, I don't know, authenticity wise, but something, a puppet that they did for Cramel Milk. Yeah, it was the same. Uh, Cramel was one of the many other 
companies okay. that they did them. And that and, was going for yeah. ninety nine dollars, correct? Yeah, there have been um, you know a few years back. I think the museum acquired a set for the Henson Exhibit Museum of the Moving Image, and they get harder and harder to come by because they were made out of you know relatively inexpensive vinyl and. It, it cracks and damages over time, so it's harder to find them. And, and even though they made 25,000 of them, a lot of them, I'm sure, ended up being thrown away by right. parents. And the sponsor you mentioned was SK Meats. Yep. <laughs> I love it because there's so many of those ads on YouTube. You can see in that long 30-minute thing. It's so great. Yeah, and they won yeah. an Emmy. And then going from black and white to color. You don't think about that now, but... <laughs> Yeah, and and Jane Henson had told me that Jim really liked working in black and white. So, you know, I was happy to get the new technology, but he had worked out everything. So he had to come up with, back then there was something called compatible color, which meant that it was color broadcasting, but the show would always be broadcast as well. It was compatible with black and white TV sets. You know, when I was growing up, you know, we were between color television sets. My parents had gotten color when my brother was, you know, a baby. And then by the time I came along, that color set had already blown out. So we had black and white when I was growing up. So I always thought we're going to see, you know, Batman in color. I didn't know what that meant because I didn't see any color. So that was compatible color, which meant that Jim had to sort of look at creating these backgrounds and new puppets that would look good both in color and in black and white, which is challenging. I can imagine. Yeah, because every they had to go... Batman that you mentioned in color is what started to harm some of the shows, the monsters and stuff like that. And what shifted Lost in Space from black and white to color because of Batman. So like Batman really blew up color, right? Yeah. I mean, and it would have happened it, anyway, but. The shame is that we don't really see, we don't have a lot of Sam and Friends color, either in still photography. There are a couple of films that they had, Jim had taken what he had done on Sam and Friends and took it to a, a film studio and record and filmed it in 16 millimeter. But most of what we see in Sam and Friends is black and white. So I always think I thought of, of Sam and Friends as a black and white show. And I would talk to Jane Henson about that. And she always thought of Sam and Friends as a color show because it switched to color fairly early on. You know, it was like 1959. You know, the show had been on a few years, but 1959, they were in color. So she always, her memories of Sam and Friends is that it's a color TV show. I always try and tell people, hey, yeah, think of it in color. And I know <laughs> that, uh, you know, because of, of the publication limitations of my book, pictures are in black and white. If you uh, get an ebook, I think you'll see any color pictures will be in color in my, my book on, uh, as an ebook. It's like, yeah, it was color. There's so many amazing details. And like you said, this book is broken into two parts. It's all the history and then half the, probably actually more than half the book is scripts. So you can just kind of, you can go watch it online and get a feel for it. Tried to break down the, the synopsis of, even if we didn't know what the Muppets were doing, I'd sort of summarize what song they were doing it to. We had listings of songs and things before we got to the recordings of the actual episodes. You know, I had no idea I was, when we first started thinking about this book, you know, I approached Henson's about it and, you know, Lisa Henson actually, like, is there enough for a book? And I was like, I think there is. Karen Falk, archivist says, yeah, we think, you know, there's enough. And I didn't have any idea that I was going to get nearly 600 pages out of it. I was hoping if I can get like 200 pages and it just kept getting longer and longer. And I would sent my publisher very concerning. He's like, it's getting longer. And he's like, great. You know, <laughs> it's like, but you're going to have to increase. The price. I don't care. People are interested. They'll buy the book. I think that's what's happened. You know, it's fascinating. I mean, if you love TV history, if you love the Muppets, if you love both, even better. I mean, this book is incredible, incredible. One of the cool things with the scripts is it shows images of like the handwriting. Mm -hmm. And just when you think, oh, I can't read this handwriting. Boom. It's all typed out on the next page. Yeah. It's, <laughs> uh, that's one of the things that I'm like, I have to do it this way because, you know, Jim's handwriting, you know, it, it, even if you're seeing the page up close, it takes a while to decipher. But I knew that once it was shrunk down to the size of a, a book page and printed in black and white, and it was not, it was going to be a challenge. You could take out all the type pages and release it <laughs> as the hardcore version. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think when uh, this follow up book, script book, will be, uh, I won't use the side by side thing that much. We'll have images of the original script sort of as 
a little bit of a highlight here and there, but primarily it's going to be the, the transcribed, typewritten, and proofread uh, scripty. So final question is, all right, Sam and Friends went off the air in 1961. When was the last time, if ever, that we saw them again, other than before your book? That is a great question. With the exception, I think Yorick popped up in a Sesame Street film very briefly. But then in 1985, 86, the Muppets did a 30th anniversary show. It was produced by a, a great television producer, Andrew Solt, who now owns the Ed Sullivan Library. He's a really nice guy. He's a big friend of Jim Henson Legacy over the years. And they produced the Muppets, a celebration of 30 years. And the format of this show was that they were honoring Kermit for his birthday. So they had a whole big dais. And they had sort of banquet tables and each of the banquet tables, it's like, oh, the Fraggle Rock characters were here and the Sesame Street, we have a couple of tables here. So all of the different characters that Jim had created and one of the tables had the Sam and Friends cast. So they had been cleaned up a little bit and spiffed up, but so they had a little bit of a cameo in that special because the Kermit introduces, they, or someone introduces a collection of these earliest clips from Sam and Friends and then. Fozzie is sort of the toastmaster. It's like, oh, and here they are, the Sam and friends. And they had a little dialogue with Kermit. It's like, how come you look so much better and we look like this? You know? <laughs> and Kermit's like, oh, you know, that's one of the things about being a Muppet. You know, that I think was the last time that the Sam and friends characters were seen on television. And now it's sort of a, they live in a, a legal limbo because Kermit is owned by the Disney company. And the rest of the Sam and Friends characters are owned by Henson. But it was a frozen situation where neither can use the Sam and Friends characters without uh, mutual permission. So in order for me to do this book, I had to get permission from both Henson and Disney. They were all very, very supportive because it's an interesting story to tell. And I think it's an inspiring one to young artists. You have this guy, Jim Henson. He started starts working in television in high school, created Kermit when he was first year of college, pretty much, and did this whole show in college that ends up being a blueprint for revolutionizing an entire art form for television. It's just amazing. And I, I sort of, whenever I do presentations, I try and encourage these young artists that Jim was able to do what he did with very primitive equipment and it was amazing what he was able to accomplish. Absolutely amazing. He touched and changed, I think, a lot of lives. I think we're all better off because of Jim Henson. I, I, I appreciate you making this book. Thank you so much. Thank It was really a labor of love. I think of all of the things that I've done in association with the Muppets, I think I'm proudest of this. And partially it's because I'm telling Jim's early story, but also that I'm telling Jane Henson's story. She was Jane Neville when she first met Jim. And for many years, I, I knew her for quite a few years, and Jane would always downplay her own importance to the story. And she would say, oh, I was just a helper. Jim was the one with the vision. And the more I explored and I'm like looking through all of this great historical stuff, and I'm like, oh, here are the letters of incorporation. Jane was a 40% owner in Muppets Incorporated. That's not what a helper is that's a partner and i think that while i think jane would be a little uncomfortable with this book if she were alive but i felt that it was a a great part of the story to share so i wanted to give jane a lot of the credit that she has for many years deflected towards jim and and in no way i'm not lessening jim's contribution yeah he was the incredible creative vision but Jane was very important to the story. So I think one of the reasons that I really loved telling it was to give Jane some of this proper credit. Were Jane's and Jim's kids appreciative of that? Yes. Yeah. I think that I was very happy. I got some, a lot of great response from, from Jim's kids. And one of the things that they were very happy about was that their mom was getting some real credit for this. You did Jane good. You did Jim good. Sam and friends good. Craig, this is, I mean, it's an amazing book. Everyone should, oh, needs I, to go get it. Share the, the website and all that kind of stuff so where people I can find it. it. 
Yeah, if you're looking for it, you can go to bearmannermedia.com. It's all one word together, Bear Manor Media. You can go to salmonfriendsbook.com. If you get a copy of the book and send, uh, go to salmonfriendsbook.com, you can send me a picture of you with the book, and I will send you an autographed book plate and a bookmark and a sticker and all that stuff. And uh, if you, uh, you can also find it online, uh, wherever other books are sold, darnsandnoble.com, amazon.com, and uh, a lot of other places. Awesome. Thanks for hanging out with me and sharing all these great oh, stories. Oh, this is great. I, I had a great time, Jeff. I'll be, I'm happy to come back anytime. Yeah, we can talk more Muppets. I can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Dive into the movies. It'll be great. We'll do it. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, everyone. How amazing was Craig Shemin? So amazing. You definitely have to check out his book, Sam and Friends, the story of Jim Henson's first television show. Links in the show notes to everything, including the YouTube of Sam and Friends. So you can check that out. I'll even throw in my article that I wrote. So you can tell me how amazing that was also. I need some attention. No, I'm just kidding. Another huge thanks to Craig Shaman for bringing all this Muppet history to the show. Thank you, sir. And of course, thank you to all of you for coming back week after week. It means the world to me. And I'll see you next time for listening to this episode of Classic Conversations. If you like what you heard, don't be shy and give us a follow on your favorite podcast app. Also, why not go ahead and tell all your friends about the show? You strike us as the kind of person that people listen to. Thanks in advance for spreading the word and we'll catch you next time on Classic Conversations. Classic Conversations.